Amen. I always love being here and sharing with our church family. That's on. Why don't we go ahead and, and open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word, your word that is seed in our hearts. Bless us now, Lord, as we study your word together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The seed. This is the time of year, and we, I think we were chatting a little bit around a prayer meeting, or maybe it was, maybe it was last night on, on Vespers, about how it's the time of year to start a garden, isn't it? Have you got some starts going in your, in your greenhouse? Bob, you got some, got some things going? Working on it? <laughs> it's about that time of year, yeah. I mean, it, it's hard to believe because we've had snow on the ground, and there's still, I, sp I think the weather forecast said it's supposed to be well below freezing tonight, and ah, I don't like the cold, I'm ready for spring. Um, there's still a little bit of winter, don't worry, <laughs> for those of you who like winter. But we're all thinking about and preparing for the spring, for the sowing, for the garden, for the good, I can't wait to sink my teeth into a bright red garden tomato. I'm tired of these grocery store tomatoes. I want a garden tomato. <laughs> I got to tell you a story. I, I, I told the kids a story, but I'll, I'll tell you. Um, one of the reasons that I am not a very good gardener is because I tend to be impatient. Um, when my in-laws moved to Kentucky, uh, my father-in-law bought a tractor um, with, a, with a, front, uh, a front end loader. And that's when I suddenly got excited about gardening. Because <laughs> that was so much fun. I mean, you could feel like Superman on the, back, on, the, on the seat of that tractor. Just drive, and there's small trees, you know, pile of dirt, you know, just, you know. It's so much fun. <laughs> Kids don't get any ideas. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun driving. It was a small tractor. It wasn't a big tractor, but still. I mean, it was a tractor. So I'd drive it around, and, and uh, I remember a story about my friend uh, when I was in college, my friend Ben. Um, told me this story. It was one of my first years in community college, and Ben, ben and I had, had uh, gone on mission trips together. Uh, we'd actually gone to Cuba together. Anyway, uh, ben, Ben's family lived on a horse farm. They raised horses and trained horses, and um, they lived over in Wayne County. If you've ever been over to Wayne County, it's nothing but rocks. Rocks, rocks, rocks everywhere. And their farm was, was full of rocks. And rocks aren't great for horses. You know, you're riding your horse around, and you trip over a rock, and the horse injures itself. And I mean, these were, these were costly horses, right? So it made sense for them to try to improve the farm. So one day, Ben's dad got a great idea. He bought a bulldozer. I don't remember how many acres they had, 40 acres or whatever they had. He bought a bulldozer. And, and the as the story goes, and Ben was telling the story to me, and you had to know the family. They, they're such a great family, and uh, always teasing each other, always ribbing each other, and, and, and always up for a good, a good laugh and a good sense of humor. But, but as, as Ben told the, the, the story, um, they named the bulldozer Lucille. So every day, Ben's dad would go out and jump on, on, on Lucille, and off they would go, vroom, 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 on a bulldozer. And uh, Ben's dad had one thing in mind, and that was to rid the farm of the rocks. And the family watched with chagrin day after day as very quickly, not only was the farm being rid of the rocks, but every blade of grass, every tree, every sprig of anything green, you're smiling, you know what happened, disappeared off of the 40 acres. <laughs> Everything growing was gone when he got done with that bulldozer. And so that was the story that they told and retold of Ben's dad and Lucille. And, and, and they, I think they had a party and rejoiced when Lucille was finally sold. <laughs> it took quite a while for the grass to grow back on the farm. Well, Jesus told many stories. Many, much, much of the parable, much of the teachings of Jesus is couched in the, in the language of agriculture, the language of the sower and the seed. And so it's not surprising that there would be more than one story that he would tell about the sowing of the seed and the growing of the, of the harvest and the, the reaping of the harvest. 
we're, we're most familiar with the first parable that we find in Mark chapter 4, the parable of the four types of soil. When a sower went forth, it says, Behold, the sower went out to sow his seed. And there are four different types of soil, and it, and it teaches us an important lesson about sharing the seed of the gospel. In fact, this is one of the few parables where Jesus tells the parable, and then he gives a long, expanded explanation to help us to understand this parable. And another time I'll do a sermon, maybe a whole series of sermons, on the sower and the seed, because there's so much we can learn. We don't have time to unpack this all today, but it's a powerful study. It tells us how there's four different types of people, if you will, who hear and listen to the, to the gospel. Some, some are the, the wayside, where they hear but there's no response. It's, it's like the birds come and snatch away the seed. Others are like the stony ground. There's initially, there's a response. Someone gets excited about the gospel, but they don't understand the cost of discipleship. So the root is shallow. There's stony soil. And when the trials and the persecution come, they don't realize uh, the cost, and they fall away. Others, the seed springs up among thorns, but, but then it's choked out by the cares of this world. And I fear that, <laughs> I told you I wasn't going to give the sermon, but I'm giving it anyway. I fear that here in America, in the prosperity that we have in this country, yes, we have prosperity, but we also have an expectation that we should live a certain standard of living. I'm not saying we, I, I mean, I want to live that standard of living just like everybody else does. I want to have a car and a house and a two-car garage. And, I mean, I want it. Like, don't get me wrong. But the busyness that we have to put ourselves in to maintain that standard of living chokes out, oftentimes, our interest in spiritual things. The thorny ground. And finally, we have the good soil. Those who receive the word, and it grows, like we talked about to the, the corn with the children, it grows and produces the harvest, 30, 60, 100-fold. Now, as a leader in the church of God, as one who has a, a strong interest and always have in, 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 in not only planting the seed, but seeing the seed grow, I have a problem. I want to take personal responsibility for the soil. I want so badly for the harvest to come that if the harvest doesn't come, I believe there's a problem with the sower or a problem with the seed or I, I want to fix it. I could tell you a story about... Um, and, and uh, I don't want to run out, out of all of our time, but I'll tell you, tell you briefly. When I was a teenager, going to college, I was very shy. Um, early 20s, I was very, very shy. Tried to connect with my friends. Didn't make a lot of friends. I remember going to a Christian student organization and feeling so out of place. All of the students there were from a, a different church, and I was, I was there, and I, I felt like the, you know, the, the third wheel. You know, I just, just didn't really click. I remember... Um, my biology teacher. I don't know if he was a Christian or, 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 or not. He didn't seem to make a strong profession, at least in class. But uh, he was teaching strongly about evolution. Of course, that's part of the curriculum, obviously. And I remember uh, it was the day we were supposed to review for a test, and one of my Christian classmates challenged my biology professor on creation versus evolution. And he smiled a little bit and closed the textbook and spent the next 40 minutes debating with that student about creation versus evolution. At the end of the period, they were like, uh, what about the review for the test? Oh, the test is tomorrow. That was your review. And of course, we had no review for the test because <laughs> there was nothing about creation on that test. Um, there, was, there were a lot of people that I tried to share with, but not many people had more than a passing interest in what I had to share about spiritual things. But there were a few. There, were, there, there, was, there was one. I remember uh, Robert, who was a student of my dad's, and and uh, I wasn't the one who planted the seed per, per se, but I remember having a lot of deep spiritual conversations with him. And he came to be uh, a, a very strong and close friend and, 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 and came into this third angel's message. I remember another man. We had, our church had evangelistic series, Roger. And uh, he became so excited when he learned the truth about the Sabbath and what happens when a person dies. And, and he became so excited um, when he learned the truth about the second coming and, and, and the signs of the times. And he joined our church family. He was the only one of all of his family, and all of his family lived close. I mean, you know how families are around here. All of his family were close. He was the only one of his family 
to join this cultish church at the Seventh-day Adventist. You know what I'm talking about. And, 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 and they, all, they all sort of distance themselves from him. You know how it goes. And, and at first, you know, he was strong. He believed, in, he trusted the Lord, and he believed the truth. And for us, we thought, well, that's enough. Great. He's, I mean, those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, right? But what we didn't realize as a church, and I know this looking back on a story that I'm telling you, we didn't realize the extent of how much he had lost in losing his connection with his family. You see, I come from a, I come from a, a family, my family is very loving, um, and uh, I talk to my brother sometimes on the telephone, or he comes to visit me sometimes. My mom and I, we get together, we, we have a fi fun time. But, but for a lot of people here, family is your identity. Family is your life. Family is who you are. Without your family, who are you? And for Roger, when his family took a step back, started to ostracize him because he had joined this cultish church, he threw himself on his church family, expecting us to be his family. And we didn't know how to take it. We didn't know how to be the family for Roger. He'd ask us for a favor, and sometimes we would, and sometimes we wouldn't. And sometimes we thought he was taking advantage of us. He'd invite us to come to certain functions, and once in a while we would come, and once in a while, or more than, not, more than often than not, we wouldn't. And pretty soon, Roger started coming to church less and less. Not that he be believed less. He still believed everything, because it's from the Word of God. It, but it was hard. It's hard being alone. It's really hard being alone. And he had lost his family that he had. And we weren't his family. We, we wouldn't be his family where he'd come to. Well, I want you to keep that story in your mind. Eventually, I'm not telling you this story to be discouraging. I'm just sharing this story because it's, it's true. Eventually, we didn't see Roger anymore. And I'm not for sure when he actually stopped coming to church because... No one really honestly noticed that much because he just started coming less and less. And no one really knew where he went because no one really called him and checked on him, myself included. And, and I, I, I bear the guilt for the story that I'm telling you because I could have been the one to reach out to Roger. I was young, but I was already starting to be a leader in the church at the time. Until... And to this day, I don't know where Roger went. I hope, I, I mean, I hope in the kingdom we'll find that Roger went to another place and found another church family and, 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 and was welcomed in and, 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 and continued to love the Lord and his truth. That's how I hope the story ends. But I don't know. I don't have his number. I don't have his address. I don't know where he went. He's gone. And the sad, you know what's the saddest thing about the story? I'm telling the story of Roger, and that's his real name. And I hope if this goes on the internet, Roger, if you listen to this one day, come back. I want to I wanna know your address. <laughs> but, but the problem is that Roger isn't just one person. Roger is 10, 20, 50, 100 people that I've known that have come through the doors of a various churches. And slowly, imperceptibly, have drifted away and nobody noticed. Nobody saw. Nobody called them. Nobody said, how are you doing? And every year we get together as a church family, as a church board. I'm talking to us because I just, you know, we're family here, and I, and I feel like I could talk this way. And we say, what can we do as a church to get the gospel out in our community and the gospel out in the world? And I have to ask the question, are we more concerned with the fruit of our work than with our faithfulness to the work? Oftentimes, now I told you I'm an impatient gardener. I'm the one who wants to go out and run a bulldozer through the garden because I can see the results when I'm done. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Amen. Two hours with a bulldozer and phew, everything's flat, everything's tilled, everything's leveled. You know, everything. I can see those results. I don't like sitting and watching the seeds grow because it's painfully slow. And the weeds grow so much faster. 
Now, this isn't a new problem. It's a human problem. And, and we're humans. We're part of it. We are God's church, but we are humans. I want to take the credit for the fruit. I want to take the blame for the no fruit. And if someone else is doing it, if God is doing a work and using someone else to do it, I want to give that person the credit. <laughs> Corinthian believers had that problem. They, started, they got into an argument. There were two, two teachers who came to Corinth and taught the gospel. One was the Apostle Paul, and we know a lot about the Apostle Paul. There was another teacher we know a little bit less about, but we do know his story, Apollos. And Apollos was a champion for Christ. He was a champion for the Lord before he knew about Christ. And it was, it was Aquila and Priscilla, if you remember, who, who took him aside and said, we need to tell you about Jesus. And he learned about Jesus, and he's a champion for the Lord. And they began to argue, I was baptized by Paul, and I was baptized by Apollos. And guess what Paul says? Look what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I planted, Apollos watered, but who caused that seed to grow? God caused the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God causes the growth. Brothers and sisters, we have got to get out of our complex where we are growing the garden. Brothers and sisters, I will tell you, I've, I've grown a few gardens in my life. I have never grown a garden. All I have ever done, physically, I mean in a garden, all I've ever done is planted a seed. Till the soil. Put some water out there on the, on the soil. Put up a fence to keep the, I did all those things, but I have never grown a garden. You know why? Because I don't even know how a seed grows. I really don't. It's, it's a mystery to me how I can take something that's a little tiny fleck of something that looks perfectly dead and put it in the ground and a plant comes out of it. I don't know how that works, but I know by faith that it does because every time I do, the plants come up. And it's a miracle from God. And brothers and sisters, I also don't know how. By taking and reading black and white words on a page that someone's hard heart can be softened. It doesn't make sense to me. How can words on a page, ink on paper, how can it change a heart? It's not the ink on the paper, friends. There's plenty of books. that The world is full of books. There's plenty of books. It's the work of the God, the Holy Spirit, working on brothers and sisters' hearts. There's nothing about putting something on the Internet. Some of these messages are going to go on the Internet. There's nothing about the bits and bytes and the ones and the zeros that's going to change someone's heart. But God's word can work through that seed that's planted to change someone's heart. So then the one who plants, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. I'm nothing. You are nothing. I don't often stand in the pulpit and tell my church members, you are nothing. You are nothing today in God's work. Now, there's an important part for you to play, okay? Don't get me wrong. Amen. But God's the one who grows his church. And when we can get that into our minds, we can say it's okay. That we can be faithful. And I don't care if there's nobody sitting in the pews. Or I don't care if there's a thousand people trying to crowd through the doors of this church. I can be faithful just the same and not, let, not go down into the pits of depression or up onto the clouds of ecstasy as if I thought that I did something for God. Because God is the one who does the work. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God causes the growth. I want to read the scripture again that, was, that Zach read for our scripture reading. Just a few verses later, Mark chapter 4, verse 26. And he was saying, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night and gets up daily and the seed sprouts and grows. He himself does not know how. And the soil produces crops by itself. First the stalk, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. Brothers and sisters, God's gospel truth grows in the heart in mysterious ways that we cannot fully explain. But God will bring the increase. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you shall find it after many days. I have some pictures to go with these slides, and I'm wondering if it's possible that my uh, computer has gotten disconnected. I didn't have a lot of pictures, but I did have the picture of the bulldozer for you to see. <laughs> and a few of these verses. So let me see if 
Yes. It, it, will, it will work now. I had some verses on the screen, but you have those in your Bible. All right. We have, we have the verses now? Okay. I think it's, it's going to work. Uh-oh. Oh, oh, boy. We're going we're gonna to try this one more time. Because I do have some pictures later on that I do actually want you to see. And if, if nothing else, I will have, I'll have one, of, one of the kids uh, advance the slides for me so you can see the pictures later. Try this one more time. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have one of you. I'll show you which button to push, and I'll just I'll just tell you. You wanna come help me? I'll show you which button to push, so you can you can flip the slides for me. That'll work. Yeah. Take this. I'll flip this back that way, that way. Okay. I'll tell you. I'll tell you when to when to flip the slides for me. How's that? <laughs> or I may just stand a little closer there there myself. But anyway, that because I've got to see that I've got to see my my slide. That that way. Now I can. Get, will that work if I if I stand oh, yeah. over there? Yeah. Okay. We got the camera there. That'll work. Now we can. Now we can work. Okay, we'll we'll keep going. The soil produces crops by itself. First the stalk, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. I want to tell you. Go ahead and, and, and switch it. I want to tell you a story. Another story about another kind of seed. This is a, I think, the most fascinating seed in the world. It's not truly a seed. Te technically, they call it a propagate, but I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it a seed. This. Does anyone? Can anyone tell me the type of tree that this is growing from? Anyone seen something? You know? Ah, uh, it's you're you're close because it's a tropical it's a tropical tree. No, but you're close. It's a tropical tree. It grows on the coastline. In fact, this tree is growing in salt water somewhere on the coast. It starts with an M. It's a mangrove yeah. tree. This is the seed of the mangrove tree. Okay, you can, you can skip it to the next, next slide. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this seed. This seed falls down. It's, a, it's actually a part of a plant. It's a living thing. This propagate of the, of the mangrove tree falls down, and it falls into the water. Because these trees grow in the water. And every day the tide comes in, and the tide goes out. And there's not many things that can grow in the partially salty water when, on the on the shoreline where the where the tide keeps part of the day it's flooded by water part of the day it's dry how can anything grow there seaweed can't grow normal plants can't grow but it's perfect for the mangrove tree and the seed falls in and it gets washed away by the water and it drifts in the ocean currents and if it drifts out into the open ocean you know how salty the ocean is the salt water is dense and that that seed will flip up and just float on the surface of the water just like this and it will float, and it can float for miles. It can float for a year on the surface of the water until it drifts up to a place where the water is brackish. You know what that means when, the, when I say the water is brackish? That means it's partly salty, but it's not as salty as the ocean water. It's just a little bit salty. And you know, brackish water is a little bit less dense than ocean water. And so that seed that was floating like this, it turns and it starts floating like this, like you see in the picture here. These, you can go to the next slide. These are, are floating in the brackish water. And as they're floating here, after a while, those little sprouts start coming out of the bottom. And the tide comes in and out, and it washes it up into the shore. And pretty soon, as the tide one day, the tide starts going out, those, that, the bottom of that plant will get stuck in the mud. Now, we don't want to get our cars stuck in the mud. But for a seed like this, that's exactly what it wants to do is it gets stuck in the mud because those roots start growing down. And we'll go ahead and go to the next slide here. And the shoot starts coming up, and it grows. Like we've been talking about growing things all day. Now go to the next slide. I want you to see what happens because this is the most strange plant in the entire world that I've ever seen, where as it grows, it sends on more roots like legs of, a, of, a, of some kind of 
incredible spider that goes down into the ground and anchors itself in the ground. Now, what happens on the shoreline of the sea? I told you the tide comes in and out every day. Those tide currents would wash most plants away, but it doesn't wash us away because it's anchored, rooted in the ground. There's also, there's also storms. There's, yeah, there's winds, there's hurricanes, but it's rooted down in the soil. And go to the next slide. I want, to s- want you to see a picture of a mature mangrove tree. Look at how it's rooted down in the ground. It looks like the water all around, but it's rooted down in the soil. But this mangrove tree is an exception because most of the time, if you see a mangrove tree, they will not be growing like this. Go to the next slide. Because mangrove trees do not grow by themselves. Mangrove trees grow together in clusters, and their roots intertwine together and hold the soil in place. And and in the past, people have gone to these mangrove thickets and cut them down, thinking, we're going to develop this place. We're going to build things and, and all this. And guess what they found? When they cut down the mangroves, not only are they destroying habitat for fish and birds and all kinds of wildlife, but then the hurricanes come. And there's nothing to hold the soil in place. And the entire coastline can erode away because the mangroves are gone. Go to the next slide. As those mangroves grow, they can actually form islands like you saw. They can form these thickets that go for miles and miles. One of the national parks that I, I want to visit, I've not been there yet, is the Everglades in Florida. Miles and miles and miles of these coastal uh, backwaters and... Um, I'm a little afraid of running into an alligator, but if it weren't for that, I would take a canoe and just paddle all through all through the mangrove trees. I want to take a take a picture now, talking about the sea of God's church. Go to the next slide here. Imagine if this is God's church. Imagine each one of these circles is you. Imagine yourself a little bit as if you are a mangrove sprout, a mangrove tree. Now, God's church, we're together, but we don't exist in isolation. And if we go go to the next uh, the next slide there. We have connections with one another. We connect together. I know Teresa. I know Zach. I know Rachel. We know each other. And it's not just that I'm connected with one or two people. Go to the next slide. We have a network of connections where each one of us is connected tightly with each other. The next slide. And you can see in this circle, this is a picture of our church here in Williamsburg, Kentucky. Here is our church with each of the members. Now, go to the next slide. We are not alone, though, in our community. Because outside in our community, there are others. And and it's a small, I mean, there's more than six people, obviously, but I'm just showing you a diagram. There are other people out there. And some of these people are closer to one than they are to another of us. Teresa, there's some people that you know that I don't know. Go to the next slide. And we have connections. And the next slide, we reach out with these connections outside the borders of our church, if you will, to people that are within our circles of influence. Zach, do you know some people that you work with at the prison? You know some prisoners there, right? Uh, uh, Bob, you know some people that that are customers or suppliers for your farm? You've gotten to know people in in your part of the community, right? And, And each one of us has people that we know and we have connections with. Just like I told the story about Robert, who was one of my friends at college. I, I made a number of friends, but only a few that are receptive to, that will hear the word. But those who hear the word, and we go to the next slide here, eventually, you notice how I changed color? Eventually, there's others outside the walls of our church who accept the gospel and accept Jesus into their hearts. The, the gospel seed grows just like the mangrove trees grow, but it's, it's fed and it's fostered by these connections I don't know if the mangrove is like this, but there's other plants like the strawberry plant. Um, You notice how they send out runners, and the mother plant will send out, and it'll plant something else. And eventually, that plant will establish itself well enough. It doesn't need that little runner connected to the mother plant. It'll send out its own runners. And if you've got a strawberry bed that's been in, in production for a few years, it can grow and grow and hop. The runners can hop all the way out into the, into the pathways around your strawberry bed. Um, it's, a, it's, it's really fascinating to see. That's in many ways how our church grows. I could have used the strawberry plant instead of the mangrove tree. But, but uh, this is, go, go ahead. I want you to imagine, though, 
with this picture of the connections connecting out. Imagine what happens if someone that's inside of our church family, something happens to them. Maybe they, maybe they pass away. Maybe they get sick. Maybe they move away. Maybe they just get discouraged for whatever reason. And unfortunately, sadly, it happens in our church. It happens. Go to the next slide. What happens to the connections going outside of our church? You see, all these people, they were connected. They were tied in to our church. And w by pulling one piece out, and it does happen. We are not immortal. We're not perfect. All of a sudden, half of the connections from our church have disappeared. But go, go to the next slide. We're going to go back a, uh, a minute. And imagine something different now in our church. We're going to take away this, uh, this circle now, for just so you can simplify the graphic now. And I want to imagine we do something different. In, in computer technology terms, and this is very similar to computer networks, by the way, uh, which I used to work with all the time. In computer technology terms, this is what we call adding resilience, adding redundancy, okay? What if we were to simply add a few more connections? So that instead of just having one connection to each of these outside, now we have two. In fact, let's add a few more connections. Let's connect the people that are outside our circle to other people who are outside our circle. Let's fill in, and I mean, you can imagine in your minds filling this graph ev even more. Let's fill in these connections into a network of connections where people are all interconnected with multiple connections to other people inside God's family. Now notice what we've done. Where is the church now? We had to redraw the circle. We didn't bring them inside that little circle. We just grew that circle so that it's bigger, so that it's expanded, so it's now including this larger network. This, my friends, is what we call church growth. This is what we call kingdom growth. And it happens, I believe, best. It happens organically. It happens as each one of us builds networks and connections with friends. And, but in order for this to happen, the people who are Zach and Rachel's friends need to become my friends, need to become Bob's friends, need to become Ken's friends, and vice versa, so that we have uh, that resiliency, so that there's not just one point of contact into God's church, into God's family, but we all network together and become part of a family. And, and, and as we do that, we're not pulling one by one and trying to pull people into the circle. You're never going to get all these people into that little circle but you're going to expand the circles. And pretty soon, this is going to grow to the point that we have a circle here and a circle here, and it's going to be what we call multiplying, not dividing the church, multiplying, where now we have other circles that then go out and expand and grow. And go ahead to the next slide. Look at what the mangrove looks like after it's been growing and growing. Look at, can you tell me how many trees, mangrove trees, are in this picture? You can't tell one tree from the next. It's formed a hedge. It's formed a, a jungle of mangroves. And brothers and sisters, I believe this needs to be the picture of God's church. We are busy. Go ahead, go ahead to the next slide. We're busy planting the gospel seed. But let's remember, we're not just planting wheat. We're not planting trees like oaks that stand alone. Even oak trees really don't grow alone. We, we see them alone. We're planting mangrove trees. We're planting something that's going to become a network. And in doing this, we need to be connected with one another. And as we do this, brothers and sisters, we can change the world. I want you to see the next slide here. This is a picture uh, of a tropical coastline from space. And notice how the, the green here, notice these, this green here, notice this green here. These are mangrove. Look, look, look at here, all that, all that green. Even from space, you can see the transformation that happens where the mangroves grow. And you can see the erosion that takes place where the mangroves aren't growing. Brothers and sisters, the word of God is living and active. The word of God is the seed. We are not the seed. We cannot be responsible for what God does. I can't let myself become proud and conceited when I see fruit being bo born. I can't my, let myself go down and discourage in the dumps when the seed is not growing as fast as I want it to. But I do have to remember, go to the next slide, 
I can't always be the one to break up all the rocks. Sometimes it's easy to want to do, I, I, I'm confessing, I want a garden with a bulldozer. I like, I like bulldozers. I like, you know, I like to see change. There's times for bulldozers. There's times we have to have bulldozers. But brothers and sisters, the seed of God's word, like the seed of these trees, look at what it's doing to this rock. The seed of God's word can break the hardest rocks. Go to the next slide. And brothers and sisters, we can become the gardeners to plant God's seed. As we connect with each other and then help to connect others to that network of connections that we call God's church. In closing, I want to invite you to, to, to sing with me a number, I believe it's number 561. Is that right? 561. We plow the fields. 561. There are things that we cannot do, but there are things that we can do to prepare the way for God's work to go forward here in Williamsburg, Kentucky. Let's stand as we sing together. We plow the fields. This is one of our older songs from the 1700s. We plow the fields and scatter the good seed. given us a work to do, to be co-laborers with you in your garden, in your vineyard, Lord, and oftentimes we try to do the work that is only yours. Help us, Lord, to remember what our work is, to plow the fields, to scatter the seed, and then to wait for the work of your precious Holy Spirit to ripen that seed into harvest. Lord, may your harvest be prepared here in Williamsburg, Kentucky, around this part of North America and the world. And Lord, help us to remember that it's not just by scattering the seed, but by connecting with our brother, our sister, our friend, our coworker, and using that connection to share the love of Christ with others. That your word can go forward. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.